Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode 12. Buddhism 101. Reciting the Heart Sutra. Okay, let's go. In Sanskrit, Bhagavati Pradna Paramita Hridaya. In Tibetan, Chomden Dema Shera Parchin Ningbo. In English, the Blessed Lady Buddha, Heart of Transcendent Wisdom. Thus did I hear on a special occasion the Blessed Lord was dwelling on the vulture peak at Rajagirha, together with great communities of mendicants and bodhisattvas. At that time, the Blessed Lord entranced himself in the teaching samadhi called the Illumination of the Profound. Just then, the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, was contemplating the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, and he realized that those five body-mind processes are void of any intrinsic reality. Venerable Shariputra addressed the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, thus, when any noble son wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, how should he learn? Then the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, addressed Venerable Shaladvati Putra thus, Shari Putra, when any noble son or noble daughter wishes to engage in the practice of the profound transcendence of wisdom, he or she should realize it in this way. Those five body-mind processes should be truly realized to be void of any intrinsic reality. Matter is voidness, voidness is matter, voidness is not other than matter, neither is matter other than voidness. Likewise, sensations, conceptions, mental functions, and consciousnesses are also void. Shariputra, thus all things are voidness, signless, uncreated, unceased, stainless, impeccable, undecreased, and unincreased. Chariputra, thus in voidness there are no matter, no sensation, no conception, no mental function, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form or color, no sound, no scent, no taste, no texture, no idea. There are no sense media from eye to mentality senses, and there are no consciousness media from visual to mental consciousness media either. There are no ignorance and no cessation of ignorance, and so on up to no old age and death and no cessation of old age and death either. Likewise, there are no suffering, no origination, no cessation, no path, no intuitive wisdom, no attainment and no non-attainment either. Therefore, Shariputra, because the Bodhisattva is without attainment, he lives in reliance on transcendent wisdom. His spirit is unobscured and free of fear. Beyond all confusion, he ultimately succeeds in nirvana, and all the Buddhas who live in past, present, and future rely on transcendent wisdom to reach manifestly perfect Buddhahood and unexcelled perfect enlightenment. Such being so, there is the mantra of transcendent wisdom, the mantra of great science, the unexcelled mantra, the uniquely universal mantra, the mantra that eradicates all suffering. It is not false and should be known as truth. The transcendent wisdom mantra as follows, Tadyata, Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhi Swaha. Two more times. Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhi Swaha. Om Gate Gate Paragate Parasangate Bodhi Swaha. Shariputra thus should the Bodhisattva, the great hero, learn the profound transcendence of wisdom. Thereupon the Blessed Lord arose from that samadhi and applauded the noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero. Excellent, excellent noble son, so it is, so it is. One should practice the profound transcendence of wisdom in just the way you have taught it. 
and even the transcendent Buddhas will joyfully congratulate you. Then the Blessed Lord had spoken thus, the Venerable Sharadati Buddha, the Noble Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara, the great hero, everyone in that audience and the whole world, with its gods, humans, titans, and fairies, rejoiced and all applauded what the Buddha said. And then you say something like, go away any bad spirits, and you clap three times. That's it. That's how you start a class. <laughs> Traditionally, in the Tibetan thing. Because when any kind of bad spirits or goblins or whatever, ghosts who are lurking around, they hate this heart sutra. They just make them run away. They don't like it. <laughs> Supposedly. And the clapping is also like that. That's why the British were so shocked after they killed 6,000 Tibetans and invaded and marched into Lhasa in 1904. The Tibetans were all clapping. <laughs> and the British thought they were being applauded. But they were hoping that would make them leave. But they didn't leave. But they did leave in a little while. Actually, the leader of the expedition, Mr. Young Husband, Colonel Young Husband, he had an epiphany, actually, in Tibet. And he founded a World Peace Institute and all sorts of things after invading. So anyway, I'm glad we did that, because I like to start a class that way. It gives a good spirit. And it's very key, because we're talking about Tantra, and we're looking at visualization, which we're going to be looking at. And really, we're not capable, most of us, in practicing Tantra. We don't have initiation, etc. although some of you may have some initiation from some Lama. And that's fine, then you can practice that. But it has to be specific to a specific Tantra. But this sutra is very important because it gives you kind of the basic place to begin, which is in non-duality. You know, do you re people used to say, in the conventional translations of this, they say form is emptiness, and emptiness is form. And when people hear that, they don't really get much of a shock. Because they say, well, form, yeah, like you can have empty form. You can have empty form. It's a dull form, and then it's empty inside. You know? It doesn't really get that. Because the, it's a mistranslation. I mean, emptiness is not wrong, but voidness is better because it's only two syllables. Emptiness is three, and voidness is two. And it's also not a common word, voidness. So it's more of a, you can especially put it in your mind as meaning specifically this kind of voidness or this kind of emptiness rather than any kind. That's one. And then form is a mistranslation because the word rupa uh, Sanskrit word rupa, it can mean form, and it, when it does mean form, it is a visual object. And you can say, actually, the visual object itself is defined in the Buddhist, you know, writings as form and color, or shape and color. Because in a way, maybe color isn't exactly a form, but it could be. So anyway, form is all right as a translation for it as a visual object. But in this context, the aggregate or the mind-body process, body-mind process, is the material processes in the body, whether visible or not. If you follow me, the energy process is all material, you know, earth, water, wind, fire. And so this is matter, not form, right? Now that gives you the non-duality shock when you hear that matter is voidness. That's a real contradiction, seemingly, isn't it? Like this we define space as the absence of, in English, and similar to Tibetan the same way, it's Sanskrit the same way, space is a double negation. It's the absence of impenetrability. Do you get that? A double negation. Meaning that you can put something in a space because there's nothing impenetrable in that space, right? So it's the absence of impenetrable, impenetrability, it's the definition of space. So, and we think of space as empty and that something's not in it. But matter is voidness means, it doesn't mean that this table is in voidness. It means that this table, this, this table which seems solid to me, my hand, which seems solid to the table, they are voidness. They're not in voidness, they are voidness. You follow me? That should be a shock to you to think about that. And why are they voidness? Because they are devoid of any non-relative element. That's why they're voidless, if you follow me. In other words, my hand and this table only seem to have solidity and to be somehow not just a space because 
I don't know its true nature. If I knew its true, and because I think that they are things in themselves, so to speak. The table has intrinsic tableness. My hand has intrinsic handness. Even if I do like modern science or ancient atomic science, which they had in ancient time, where I think that my hand and the table are made of atoms, then I think the atom is impenetrable and it has an intrinsic nature of not being empty. But according to the Buddhist scientists from Buddha's time on, that atom is empty. But why? Because when you look for the atom, it dissolves under your analysis. Do you follow me? And that's what. And now, finally, with our machines, we caught up with that, which the great yogis of ancient time discovered with their minds. That which are which have mechanical apparatus. You know, the brain is a mechanical apparatus of the mind. The eye is a mechanical apparatus of the mind, and uh, it mechanically keeps taking things down into its component parts. And then the parts have parts, and then parts, and then they all, then it all dissolves under analysis. Do you follow me? Like you get down, if you go to your nose, or my favorite is the nose, I've done this with you before, some of you, but you, I hope you practice that thought experiment. What you finally get down is your nose is a number, an infinite number of points on your nose, but as you know, every point on your nose is not on your nose, because a point has no size. Right? X, Y is not a dot. X, Y has no size at all, so it's actually not there, it's an abstraction. Right? So, so the seemingly hard thing is composed of infinite numbers of things that are not there. <laughs> <laughs> and this was discovered by Buddha. And previous Buddhas before him, of course, but in our recorded history by Buddha. And now in the Copenhagen, they announced the quantum people that they discovered. And even then, they dared say, well, there's a quantum down there, but we don't know what it is, because we can't find it. But it's got to be there. The word quantum means the quantity of something. But there's no quantity of a point. A point has no quantity, right? A dot is not a point. It's a small circle. OK? You, you all know this, or you're familiar with this. So what that means is, so what that sort of matter is voidness means that when you don't try to pin down exactly what matter really is, it's there. But when you really analyze it to sort of verify, okay, it's really this. This, this contact between these two things is an in inevitable solidity. It makes that noise. I can't put my hand through that table. But that's the illusion. If I really analyze both my hand and the table, they will both dissolve under analysis. And modern scientists will also dissolve the matter of my hand and the table under analysis, and they get that. But they are fri they're frightened of that. People are scared of that. And that's why they go to all that huge expense, and they went out hunting the Higgs boson. And they found that Higgs boson by quadruple, triple inference according to their theories. They never, nobody caught no Higgs boson. No way. If you read even in the newspaper, you know, that there's all this, it exploded, something exploded, and then it went patterned like this, and then statistically they saw blip, 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 this, and that, and the other, and that meant it must have exploded, according to their theory, but they never saw it. And then they announced it triumphantly to get the next 11 billion to build the new smasher. And they smartly moved to the south of France for that one to have better food. <laughs> in between experiments. And they, but then they needed that or 20 billion to make the new one down there under those limestone rocks in Provence. And uh, then they put down a little caveat at the bottom of those articles and it said, well, but then all these little things, this boson, you know, that supposedly accounts for mass, you know, for volume of mass, is surrounded by 70% dark matter and 27% dark energy, and we have no idea what they are. Because <laughs> they're so dark, we can't see them at all. But by theory, they must be there. Give me a break. <laughs> okay, so, so the, my point being that, therefore, since matter is voidness, whatever shape the matter has is illusory. Now that, we can, we can understand that maybe sort of, you know, intellectually, 
you know, like this is all here made of even atoms, even if we have an earlier version of science, this is all atoms. Atoms are model of an atom is like an empty thing with the, the nucleus much smaller than the sun in the solar system and the electrons dipping around much smaller than planets, but mostly empty space inside there, by far more empty space. We, we sort of, so then, yeah, it's kind of an illusion. We can admit that. If we go to the quantum level, it's a really big illusion because then you can't even be sure there's solid little atoms in there. But instead of being afraid of that, what it then makes us free to try to do is to reshape everything. And this is where Tantra comes in. Tantra is the art and science of reshaping everything really dramatically by liberating, because, because we think, you and I think, unless some of you are enlightened, which you might be, otherwise we think that pillar, right, it, that pillar is not there because I'm imagining it. It's, luckily it's there by itself, holding up the house above it. That's what we think. But, uh, and we don't think that I'm imagining that pillar, but actually I am. And visually, we can, of course, say that because, you know, if you, even if you take a kind of analysis that light atoms, photons, are bouncing off a surface and then coming to the optic nerve and then this sort of blurry stuff is coming, all these light refractions are coming to the optic nerve in the eye, and then the concept, my concept back in my brain comes up with my idea of a pillar and fits them together and excludes light bouncing off other things, and I select from the background that pillar, and I see a solid pillar, right? So my brain is doing something, but, and that actually technically is called imagination. I'm imposing an image on a set of buzzing, blooming, confused, like swirling atomic processes, and even that I'm only describing at a meso level, not a micro level, because at a micro level, then everyone, we don't know if it's waves or particles, or no, you know, we don't know what it is that's really happening. Okay, if you reduce even further to the, the explanation of photons bouncing over here and hitting neurons and all that, which are sort of pretty meso level, you know, atomic molecular level, right? You get it? So, what I'm trying to say, therefore, is this visualization that we're then gonna look at now, this visualization stuff, is where one goes into the process of really trying to reshape. And then it's like a rehearsal. You know, the, there are, in the Buddhist cosmology, as I think I told you in the earlier classes, there are these, what are called desire realm heavens, and then there are form realm heavens, realm of pure matter, or rather pure material realm heaven, and then there are formless or immaterial realm heavens. And there's 23 of these different kinds of things, actually. Usually 8 plus 17. No, 26 of these different level things. And um, the mandalas that one visualizes <coughs> are meant to be simulations of the kind of palaces in some of the desire realm heavens. Not the two topmost ones, but other ones that are sort of pleasure realms, like Tushita, the realm of sa heaven of satisfaction, uh, Yama, the realm of non-contention. Um, those, are, there's that's two of them, and actually maybe those two, especially Tushita, I think actually. The Tushita heaven. This episode is a part of the Buddhism 101 series, using classic teachings from the archives of Robert Thurman to elucidate basic concepts of the tradition. Originally recorded on April 15, 2015 at Tibet House U.S. in New York City. To watch a video version of this podcast, please visit the Tibet House U.S. YouTube channel. And now, back to Bob. Yes. 
I don't usually, when I'm trying to like go around, I don't usually do questions. But, but, but they're saved for later because I might answer them anyway and then I get distracted and go there and there. But I will do this one since you didn't know that. Okay, what you. is the question? The uh, question is related to voidness. The what? Voidness, what you're talking about. Yeah, uh, void, yeah voidness. What you talk about understanding of voidness and how does that relate to, uh, let's say, meditation practice of impermanence or non-self? It's a deeper one than impermanence, but it's very much the same as selflessness. Non-self, we don't like, we don't say, we say selflessness. But uh, it's, it's deeper, it's the same as selflessness, really. Voidness is the same as selflessness. Because a self is what one projects into something, it's kind of like its essence. You know, and we use self also about objects. You think, first of all, self is only about persons. But I say the floor itself. So the itself reflexively goes back to sort of the essential floor. You know, the, the person, the house itself, the pillar itself. So self and intrinsic, then there are many terms for the kind of projected essence that, that we habitually place in things to make ourselves think that the things really do correspond to our notions of the things. And we, there, and there are, I, I used to say there are three, the, in the Sanskrit and Tibetan they say with different words, there's the level of intrinsic reality, the level of intrinsic objectivity and the level of intrinsic identifiability. These are my terms, and I, but I think they capture the Swabhava, uh, Swarupa, and Swalakshana, the Sanskrit and Tibetans have translations of those words, which are sort of the ontological, epistemological, and uh, linguistic level. You know, to identify something because it has an identity that's intrinsic in it, which makes it intrinsically identifiable, not relationally identifiable. Because what all voidness is, is that everything is devoid of anything non-relative. Everything is totally interwoven and interconnected, in other words. There's no non-interconnected thing. Okay? Even our concept of the negation of connection, like absolute, non-interconnected, uh, etc., something like that, those concepts themselves are connected. Because they are the opposite of what we know about. If you follow me, but uh, but uh, uh, so because we have a concept of what isn't interconnected, but voidness means the total inter everything is devoid of any non-interconnected anything. Okay, so it actually means relativity. So so that's the thing about voidness. Another thing I just want to just mention, since we didn't read the Heart Sutra together, a couple of things. One is that. Although Buddha goes into a samadhi on the Heart Sutra, which is a transcendent wisdom sutra, which is the wi transcendent wisdom is a wisdom that transcends itself, in, and it transcends even the self of wisdom, because it transcends knowing something dualistically. It's, a, it's knowing something by becoming what you know, non-dually. So in a way, it's not a possessed knowledge in a certain way. It's a knowledge where you become one with the thing that's known. So to achieve, you give yourself away to the thing, rather than you seize that thing that I know. Or you seize even the, and then people, even the experiences of, of the self melting into reality, which is transcendent wisdom, which transcends, even that experience is transcendent, in that a person who achieves it doesn't go claiming, oh, I, I we're melted into reality. They don't say that. Because once you really melt into it, you realize you were always melted into it, so you didn't do it at some particular time. Did you get that? I hope so. <laughs> so that's an important point. And the transcendent wisdom herself is envisioned as a female, a female Buddha, sometimes called the mother of all Buddhas, but Bhagavati, which means the blessed lady Buddha. You know, the Bhagavati... Uh, Pradna Paramita Hridaya is the name of the thing in Sanskrit. <clears throat> That's one. And then two, so then Buddha goes into the samadhi about it, illumination of the profound. The profound is where everything has melted, so to speak. It's the state of being melted, including it's the state itself being melted, so you're not stuck in a separate state, but that I'll get to later. But uh, that's, that's, he went into that samadhi. And then, but, but since he went into that kind of samadhi, which is a field, a field of concentration, 
everyone present kind of went into that field because being the Buddha, he's had such a powerful mentality. He introduced everyone sort of into the field without saying anything, just his own, by going into it himself, which makes sense. If you think that, what does it mean by going into that field? It means that he disappeared as a separate self, and he felt, but he didn't disappear into a state of disappearance. He disappeared into a state of disappearance, non-dual from everything and everybody. So in other words, he felt being, he was everyone present in that assembly. You follow me? At the same time as he was Buddha over there in a samadhi. <laughs> Do you follow? Mentally, he was encompassing everything in every detail of everything, micro, macro, mental, physical, everything. And therefore, his close Bodhisattva Avalokiteshvara of perfect, the, the, who's known as the great hero, the, um, the universal compassion of all Buddhas, was inspired, and he himself, Avalokiteshvara, had a vision of the five body-mind processes, that is the four levels of mind and the physical material uh, aggregate, these processes, as being devoid of intrinsic reality. Pure relativity, in other words. So then he, and then, and even and Shariputra, so that's how Avalokiteshvara felt, how he felt, and then Shariputra, who was a brilliant, enlightened sage, but still caught in some subtle level of dualism. So the way he's inspired by being in the Buddha's field of non-duality uh, is to ask a question about transcendent wisdom, like he wants to know where he is. Because <laughs> he didn't melt into being universally in it, so he wants to know where it is. And then notice the male chauvinism that arises immediately in him, uh, like a more surface level of the dualism. He says, when any noble son which is to engage in the practice of profound transcendent wisdom, how should he learn? And Shariputra answers, when any noble son or noble daughter, he responds, note, he adds, Shariputra notes it too, <laughs> a little bit nervously, and we, we, because he has difficulty interacting sometimes with some enlightened women in other sutras, we know that, but this is a very brief sutra. And then he goes ahead with this, and then the main thing is this non-duality, and then the, the, the mantra is a very nice, gate is a past passive participle. It means gone, literally. But before we make it into a kind of hipster, zoot suit type of gone, gone, really gone, although it, it's fun that it connects to that, actually. It is kind of fun. You know, like it's real gone, man. You know, like you're supposed to say when you're in a jazz club, I guess. I, don't know, I didn't get time to spend in them much. But this gate. But, but in Sanskrit, words for understanding have to do with verbs for motion, some of them. So, Because when, when you understand something new about the world, you move into a new world because by understanding it, it changes the world. You're suddenly in a world that you understand in a different way. So you've, changed, you've moved into something else rather than that you're standing under something, like in English. So gone means, in this case, gone by understanding the nature of the world, gone into the real world, out of the unreal world, is what it means. And each of the gones, the four, there are four gones here. You know, gone, gone, paragon means very gone, parasamgon means very totally gone. Those are just prefixes that mean very, and, you know, extremely, and then totally. Parasam is, you know, very totally gone. And so those are four, those are called the five paths, which are the path of preparation, the path of accumulation, the path of vision, and the path of meditation. And these are four paths going to the final one, which is bodhi, enlightenment, which is the fifth path, which is called the path of no more learning. Uh, I don't know why they put that in negative, no more learning, asaiksha. But it means a mastery, you know, um, you know, achieved enlightenment is achieved, so you don't have to learn enli about enlightenment anymore because you are enlightened. And then swaha is a salutation. It means all well, you know, all good, literally. Swaha, say, say well, literally. Suaha. And Om invokes the presence, body, speech, and mind of all Buddhas because it affirms the Buddhist non-dual idea that the infinite number of beings in the beginningless past, infinite past, 
by having become Buddhas, are here. Because they're everywhere, in all space and time. So when you say Om, from the Buddhist point of view, there are three elements in Om, Ah, U, and Um. Ah, U, and Um. And that's body, speech, and mind. You know, because the A plus U makes O in a sensible linguistics, such as they had in Sanskrit. So Om then invokes the, the, the presence of all Buddhas, infinite numbers of past, present, and future Buddhas, and then Gate, Gate, Paragate, Parasangate, Bodhiswaha. And when my translation was translated into Spanish, they didn't <laughs> know it was Gate. I told you that already, right? They thought it was a gate. So they translated, Om Puerta, Puerta. Puerta Grande, Puerta Muy Grande. <laughs> it's not bad, going through another door, you know? I was so shocked when I saw it. <laughs> anyway, I couldn't correct it, it was too late. Okay, that's all about that. Official music provided by Tenzing Shogel. All rights reserved. Used with the artist's permission. To learn more, please visit his website at tenzingchogel.com. This podcast was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and listeners like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit tibethouse.us. To learn about special intensive retreats and programs with Robert Thurman and friends at Menla, please visit menla.us, located just two hours north of New York City in the heart of the Catskill. This is podcast producer Justin Stone Diaz thanking you for tuning in to this week's episode of the Bob Thurman Podcast. If you're inspired by anything you hear here or anything we produce at bobthurman.com, please be sure to share, like, and subscribe on all your favorite social media platforms. Thanks for tuning in, and you'll hear from us next week. Tashi Delik.